molecules. They're made of atoms and they make up cells. Today I'll be focusing on macromolecules like DNA, RNA, lipids, and proteins. These days macromolecule research and education form the core of a lot of biology and medicine. And in particular, proteins feature heavily. Proteins are the backbone of cell structure, communication, metabolism, growth, protection, and the list goes on. So let's say we have a molecular story to tell, and we're at the very beginning of production. There are a tremendous number of choices to make. What I'll talk about today is not so much about constructing a narrative as much as about how we make decisions about representing molecules and how those decisions can influence our audiences. When creating visualizations, we need to be asking ourselves the question, what ideas will this molecular visualization communicate? I think there are two sides to this. Primarily, of course, there's how can I achieve my learning objectives? But I think there's also the question, what else will be implied by the visualization? What kind of biological context is presented? And will visual features that may not be specifically about learning objectives support or inhibit deeper understanding? Let's start with structures. When we visualize macromolecules, there are lots of established options for how we can represent their structure. Let's take the example of an antibody, a protein complex that has two heavy or long chains and two light or short chains. It's perfectly reasonable to use a simple shape to represent this. It sends the message that we're using a graphical schematic approach, and this is even more evident and appropriate when we're working in a two-dimensional representation. However, if we wanted it to look more organic and protein-like, we might play on the traditional Y shape and come up with something like this, with the chain ends open to grab onto antigens. But this gives the false impression of a realistic structure, and I think this approach is somewhat problematic. If we don't have real data to work with, there may be cases where a careful estimation works, but it's better to use real data if we have it. And most of the time we do. So why is data-driven structural representation so important? Or put another way, why do researchers invest so much effort in growing databases like the PDB, the Protein Data Bank? Well, this is because structure determines function. And if we want to showcase protein function, a lot of the time that can be supported by using data-driven shapes. But even with structural data to work with, we still have several options. We could choose an atomic space-filling representation, which conveys the scale and complexity of a molecule. It also shows the composition of atoms, but here you can't distinguish the heavy chains from the light chains, and it's more visually complex than other styles. A ribbon or cartoon representation can highlight structural elements, like a flexible linker or a variable region. But the volume is hard to appreciate here, especially with limited depth perception. So perhaps most commonly, we have surface representations, which can differentiate components of a protein complex and convey the overall shape, especially in motion in a 3D animation. And the volume is now clear. But volume raises an important question, because a surface mesh can either be a coarse approximation like this, or tightly adhere to atom positions. This is arguably a better demonstration of the volume occupied by the atoms. And this becomes most important when molecules are in contact. A tight meshing or high resolution surface mesh will result in binding regions being shown with higher fidelity. This animation emphasizes that point. Remember, structure defines function. So with a tighter surface mesh, we can see that there's a small gap between the DNA and this clamp, allowing it to slide along. But with coarser meshes, this clamp appears to be intersecting the DNA, which changes the interpretation of the process. It also implies that the atoms that make up these structures are intersecting, which isn't physically possible. So consideration of how to represent structure is important. And I want to look at this choice of depiction from another angle. Let's imagine we have a process we want to visualize. Instead of a molecular process, let's look at a human process, for example, throwing a ball. When we choose our structure, we might keep it very simple. And this whole representation is very simple, even schematic, but it looks okay. It certainly gets the point across. Now imagine that we have some nice structural data available. We should include it to make our visualization more realistic, right? So this looks strange. But it's not the motion in and of itself that looks strange, it's the same motion as in the first animation. Instead, it's the incongruity between the representation of structure and motion that presents a problem. 
it's also necessary to bump up the realism of the motion, and then we get something that looks coherent again. So my point with this analogy is that in addition to structural information, visualization of dynamic information should be carefully considered. We saw with this ball throwing analogy three animations across two spectrum. We had simple structure and simple dynamics, realistic structure and simple dynamics, and a realistic and realistic. Now it's important to note that the structure and the motion we saw, even in the third animation, are representations. They're not reality itself, they're not video footage. So even though I'm using the words realistic and realism, we're far from reality itself. That's obvious with the person, but I don't think that's always as understood in molecular animation. Some qualifiers here. Realistic is not always better. And in fact, structure and motion don't necessarily need to be aligned across this realism spectrum, although I think there's an argument to be made for that. And rather than a single spectrum, dynamic information involves lots of decisions across many axes, including information pertaining to motions, interactions, and populations. So in a molecular environment, what is realistic motion? Well, I'm using this to mean adapting experimental or simulation data for visualization. And simulation has a specific meaning that I'll come to in a minute. And I want to be clear that this is not about photorealism. Photorealism is an art and computer graphics term that's a completely separate issue. Remember, showing a real molecular environment for the time being is impossible. We're still very much using approximations and representations. But I want to share with you some data and concepts that can aid in presenting more accurate depictions. For starters, we can look up numbers on various metrics that can guide our design. The recent book, Cell Biology by the Numbers, gives practical information on quantitative data that can be readily translated into visualizations. Most of this information is nicely presented on their website, book.bionumbers.org. And at a much more rigorous level, molecular dynamic simulations and coarse-grained modeling use powerful computers to calculate the positions and interactions of even individual atoms within groups of molecules. This generates trustworthy data on the motions of the molecules, and computational biology labs are producing more and more of this really excellent reference material. But this stuff can also be really daunting to tackle. We don't all have supercomputers and bioinformatics degrees at our disposal. So a much simpler way to describe a dynamic molecular environment is simply crowded messiness. Well, what does that look like? So instead of showing our hero molecule moving through a fairly pristine environment, we could instead depict a complex, diverse soup of molecules. I think this fulfills the objective to show crowded messiness. Now, I'm not saying that all molecular visualizations should be presented like this, but consider the different messages that are being conveyed with one environment versus the other. In an attempt to be more practical and specific than crowded messiness, over the past year or so, Jody Jenkinson's research lab at the University of Toronto, in collaboration with Gail McGill at Harvard Medical School, have broken down some dynamic behaviors and concepts into 12 principles that we'd encourage molecular animators to consider. This list is not exhaustive, it's not chiseled in stone, nor is it established best practice. Instead, we think these concepts are important to understand and important to consider. We've designed the principles as pairs of short animations, and we have one version, a treatment A that does not adhere to the principle, and a treatment B that does adhere to the principle. Treatment B does not adhere to all of the principles, just that particular one being shown. And these illustrations use biological examples with a lot of detail stripped out, highly simplified. And I also want to note that many of the design decisions that went into these are not recommendations for all applications. Instead, these decisions were made to highlight the concept in question. All of these animations can be viewed on our research site, sciencephys.org, and we've already seen a couple of these in the presentation today, namely that molecules are physical entities with definable boundaries, and that molecular environments are crowded and diverse. But I'd like to share just a few more. First up, a couple that have to do with molecular motion. Molecules move through random collisions. This has to do with Brownian motion. If we want to show molecules moving via collisions instead of showing a smooth linear path from point A to point B, we could add some chaotic motion and have the path be less directional, while still ultimately ending up binding to the same point. Proteins also have internal freedom of motion, and this is often key to the specific functionality of that molecule. Some proteins and regions of proteins are more flexible, others are more rigid, 
These cadherin molecules are a prime candidate for this. They're moving around in the membrane, but internally they're completely static. When in reality, cadherins are much more flexible. Indeed, chemically, they have a more flexible state and a more rigid state, but even the more rigid state involves some bending and flexing. I want to share one principle about intermolecular interactions. Unproductive collisions are frequent. For molecules that have the capacity to bind together, not every encounter between complementary molecules results in binding. Typically, we see two molecules coming together, which are immediately united. But statistically, the orientations and positions are more likely to be wrong, and several non-binding collisions might occur before binding takes place. And finally, one concept about populations. This conveys the idea that in a molecular environment, inevitably there's going to be more than one copy of a given molecule. So instead of showing a single copy of each molecule and maybe a binding event between them, we could instead show multiple instances of each molecule and start with one binding event in the foreground and then repetitions to support the same idea. I know that depicting what I'm calling dynamic realism doesn't come for free, so what are the obstacles? Well, of course, there are technical limitations and overhead. It takes expertise, effort, time, and money to make molecules flexible and move randomly through crowded environments. But resources are improving quickly. I think of new tools being developed like CellPack and new modules coming to Molecular Maya. And often there are simpler shortcuts for adding behaviors that are worthwhile. I used many of these in the illustrated examples that I showed. We've also become somewhat spoiled with the accessibility of structural data. And there is dynamic data available, as I talked about molecular dynamic simulations, but it is less accessible than structural data, and it requires more interpretation and adaptation. There's also a potential lack of awareness of biophysical concepts, and in part I'm trying to address that today. But these concepts are very challenging and unintuitive. Really, molecular phenomena are so unlike macroscopic phenomena, the things that we're used to, so concepts like gravity and friction, light, color, inertia, and texture are either meaningless or completely unexpected at this scale. So I want to share just a few books which may be useful to tackle this topic in order from very accessible David Goodsell's Machinery of Life, more technical Life's Ratchet, and a textbook, The Physical Biology of the Cell. Perhaps the biggest challenge, and maybe several of you already have this in mind, has to do with cognitive load. Most of the concepts, if not all of them, add information, add motion, add elements, add visual noise. Can this be mitigated or circumvented? Well, I think so. The biomedical communicator has a large selection of tools and strategies to focus attention and ensure that the narrative remains clear. Given that there are substantial reasons not to incorporate dynamic molecular realism, are there any reasons for adding these extra layers of information? Or are there any problematic outcomes when motions and interactions are kept quite simple? For a minute, I want to contrast molecular visualization with surgical illustration. One key argument for the use of illustration over photographs is the ability to simplify for the sake of clarity. Our role as biomedical communicators is to strip away the messiness and the visual noise and bring to light just the pertinent information. Is this not true as well for molecular visualization? Yes, I think so, but consider, unlike surgeons, our audiences don't have prior experience seeing a real molecular landscape. If no one shows crowded messiness, we won't understand it that way. Visualization is so powerful for this, especially, I think, animation and interactive media. They let us see things we otherwise simply can't. Thinking back to the ball throwing analogy, we knew that the second animation with the stiff human looked wrong because we know what the real world counterpart is. But with a molecular animation, we have no real experience with it. And when some aspects of it appear to be realistic, motion or shaders, the assumption may be that all aspects closely reflect reality. Ultimately, it really depends on the learning objectives. To really understand concepts like enzyme kinetics or osmosis or protein folding, the crowded messiness of biophysical concepts are essential. Our research lab has been trying to understand how visualization can help or hinder understanding of molecular environments. Jody and Gail tried to assess the issue of cognitive load and found that the most visually complex treatment of a process, the animation on the right, 
was most effective at deepening understanding of certain concepts. So cognitive load is not innately a problem, and visual complexity can motivate more focused attention. We've also surveyed large numbers of undergraduate students with the aim of parsing out their individual ideas and misconceptions regarding molecular processes. I just want to share a few numbers from that survey. Over 75% of participants said that molecules try to move toward their binding partners, which isn't true. Almost half of students said that a ligand somehow knows where its receptor is, which isn't true. And less than a third said that the mechanism by which molecules move around is through random collisions with other molecules, and this is the most correct out of the available options. So these numbers indicate to me that most students are not thinking about random Brownian motion when they imagine cellular processes. But in another study, we showed students this still image, the first frame of an animation, and asked what they thought would happen next between the red and the blue molecules. Interestingly, almost 90% of them predicted random motion. Only 2% thought that the red and blue molecule would move directly toward each other and bind. Could it be that just seeing a picture of a crowded environment changes people's conceptions about movement? Visualization is capable of creating an intuition in a viewer's mind that is hard to come by through other means. The challenge is finding the balance between primary learning objectives and the supportive layers of context for the worlds that these processes take place in. So consider the structures that you use and consider how those structures move and interact. There remains a lot of research to be done in this area, but also a lot of experimentation and development in the industry, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and how depictions are interpreted. Once again, all of these animations, these principles, can be seen on our lab site, sciencephys.org. I want to thank Jody and Gail for leading this work, and the ScienceVis lab members and collaborators, and I want to thank you for listening to me today.